Mr. Benjamin has said he has no personal interest in Ghana's domestic politics, as is being speculated by some people. According to him, his only desire has been to see Ghana prosper in its developmental agenda. He noted the British government has at all times worked with any government Ghanaians elect during elections. In case anyone thinks that anything that follows is too critical, then please know that I am a huge fan of and advocate for Ghana. I have been privileged to call this country my home for the last exactly six months, and I have received a fabulously warm and kind welcome. I, my government, the people of Britain generally, wish nothing but the very greatest success and brightest possible future for Ghana and all its people on the long road towards full economic development. So my starting position is as a firm and supportive friend, both individually and as a representative of my country. The UK and Ghana share common goals in many areas, including economic development. The UK has a large aid program and is the only G7 country to have reached the UN target of devoting 0.7% of its GDP to development assistance, which we do both bilaterally through the European Union and through other agencies such as those of the UN. But in each country where we have a program, and our program here in Ghana amounts to tens of millions of pounds a year, we have to assure our citizens that money is being well spent and can be accounted for. And I dare say that is the same for all of Ghana's development partners. That is not to say that we are seeking to impose specific policies or systems on sovereign governments. We aren't. But we have to be able to answer the reasonable questions that our parliament and taxpayers ask and of course, many of those questions are asked by citizens in the countries we are assisting to. My second caveat is to tell you frankly that accepting this invitation was not necessarily a straightforward decision. I am well aware of a polarized party political climate and given perhaps some history surrounding how actions colonialist tag. Well, I trust that even those here who profoundly disagree with me or my government, which incidentally is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, will do so on the basis of arguments and insults. Freedom of speech and the right to disagree are very strong British and European values, but they're also African ones. I enjoyed a Zambian proverb I heard for the first time the other day. It says, if two wise men always agree, then there is no need for one of them. <laughs> so in short, please feel free to challenge me on what I say here. We welcome challenge. And let me say and state unambiguously for the record, though I honestly don't think I should need to do so, as I hope it would be self
The debate as to state funding of political parties um, has been raised over the years, but no definite decision has yet been taken. So political parties have to find their own means of funding operations. Over the last few years, the two main political parties in Ghana have often accused each other of using drug money to fund their campaigns and operations. But how does this accusation affect our body politic and international image? So to delve a bit into this debate, I have been joined online by Dr. Ali Seydou. He is a lecturer of political science department, University of Ghana. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you, too. All Good right. Opportunity. All right, doctor. So um, do, do you still think we should pursue the um, state funding political parties? Sorry, can you come again? I'm asking, do you think we should still pursue the um, state po uh, politi uh, sponsoring political parties? State funding political parties? Yes, doctor. Yeah, I think it, it's very necessary. We have all been, we have all agreed, both political parties, civil service, civil society organizations, and members of the academia that funding political parties can help solve most of the challenges that we face as a state. For example, we have realized that when governments, when political parties are in power, they enjoy the state resources that are at their disposal, and that gives them an edge over other candidates that are competing with them for the same position, but that are in opposition. So if we, one thing we have to be very clear about is that once political parties are in opposition, they will be very desperate to find several ways of funding their electoral campaigns, the number of parliamentary candidates that they're going to file, and for the presidential slot. And this is not a small job. So in desperate times, political parties are likely to use both legitimate and illegitimate means, as long as the illegitimate means always remain private to them, to be able to win power. And we have always made the assertion that even when they don't use those means, civil society organizations and powerful individuals are likely to support their campaign. And when they support their campaign, they dictate the tunes to these political parties when they win power. And even when these powerful individuals fall power of the law, there is a huge dilemma for those political parties which win power through the funding of those individuals to take them on. So it is still very important that we fund political parties but we will have to devise a strategy, a method, a procedure that will not allow people to just form political parties overnight because of the fact that there will be state funding. But we should devise a procedure that makes sure that eligible, competent political parties are giving state resources to campaign. And that will save us some of these atrocities and challenges that we go through in the name of democracy, simply because parties are desperate to fund themselves. Uh, we, we also seem to have had this debate uh, on the drug issue between the two political parties, the two main political parties, NDC and MPP. Um, what impact would th this kind of debate have on our democracy? Ghana has been known as the beacon of democracy in the sub region. That is a very huge accolade that has made Ghanaians, every Ghanaian living everywhere, very proud. It's gone with the days that people always want to associate themselves with to Ghana and being proud of being a Ghanaian. And, and you have to remember that Ghana is a member of the League of Nations across the world. And we are represented in various political, economic, cultural platforms. There are Ghanaians living outside this country. If we continue to, to engage in illicit drug trafficking and, and our, politi our politicians are willing to defend, to jump to the defense of people who fall foul of these practices, or we politicize this whole issue. What it suggests is that if you say the MPP and the NDC trade insults, who has carried drugs more than the other, then it simply suggests that what our two major political parties do is to fund their campaign through this particular trade. 
that may not be true. But once we want to, to argue that this party has done it more than the other party, then the suggestion is that one way or the other we engage in it. And that is going to have a detrimental effect on the image of the head of state of this country, on the image of the ordinary citizen who lives outside this particular country. If you are noted, we, we used to be noted for soccer. When you go somewhere and say, oh, the black stars, and you feel proud of being part of Ghana because of what the black stars is doing. But if this, this, if this is going to come in, then people will be very ashamed to be called, to be called Ghanaian because it is very dehumanizing. Um, thank you, Dr. Alidu. All right, so let's also go to Dr. Vladimir Enchidan. So he is a senior research fellow at the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. Hello, doctor. Thanks for your time here on Newsdesk. You're very welcome. Right, so how is the politicization of the drug menace uh, by our two main political parties impacting on our democracy as a country? Well, negatively, I believe. Uh, the point is, is that we are um, trying to look for a black cat in a dark room when the cat is not there. Where the cat is, we are not looking at at the point. Um, does it matter whether it is the MPP or the NDC which is engaging more in cocaine, or we are more concerned about the menace that cocaine, the problems that cocaine would give us, the, the, the trade in cocaine would give us? Uh, why government is trying practically to prove uh, what is not provable, I mean, what is not needed to prove anyway, uh, the NPP is taking it as a kind of uh, uh, political max scoring kind of game, you know. Uh, the, the, the real essence of how cocaine is impacting on our socio-economic, socio-political direction uh, is it, it, not being addressed. If we leave things the way they are, the possibility of Ghana becoming a narco state, just like Guinea-Bissau, is there. And once that situation arises, several implications. It means from the ordinary man in the street to the IDP can be bought. It means from the ordinary man in the street to the chief justice can be bought. It means state institutions, everything becomes narcotic controlled, you know, and we need to kick against that. Again, it has health implications. It has uh, social implications, armed robbery, whatever it is, you know, uh, uh, gangsterism, everything, everything, everything. It can lead to a, some kind of Boko Harams within this country. And, and that is what we should be more concerned about. But when we politicize it in the sense that whether it is NACOB or whatever it is, and we put politicize it in the state institutions, why don't we put professionals there? Why don't we make uh, NACOB uh, you know, a commission instead of a, 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 a board or whatever you call it, and put professionals there who have a tenure? I mean, they don't have to be replaced, or their, their term of office does not have to be coterminous with the term of office of any political party in power and things like that. Then we'll see them working independent of, of the government in power. But that's not what we are doing. And if we are sending the wrong signals to the outside world that we are not ready to fight the cocaine, cocaine menace. In, in Mexico, it happened until the Americans were so serious. Bolivia, the Americans now began helping them one way or the other until they got a government that was ready to fight it. And now we are seeing results. When Zedilo came to power in Mexico, the cartels, including a deputy IGT, and whatnot and whatnot. If you read the West African Drug Re uh, uh, Committee report, it's debilitating. Ghana is there. Uh, Senegal is there. Uh, every country, almost all, every country, and the Caesars and the whatnot and the whatnot. So I believe what we show into the world is very, very, very negative. So do you agree that um, as a country, we should, the state should fund political parties? It must be seriously personally. I, I have always said no. At the IEA, I would say that funding state, uh, uh, a political party is a, is a club. And many more of my colleagues don't agree with me. But we can still make it possible for democracy to work without monetizing politics. We have monetized politics to the extent that we worship money. So whoever brings money to the party is the one we worship. And because there is the patronage system, there is also uh, something to gain from winning power, and, and then be the distributor of the wealth of the nation. Why can't we have a democracy which is free and fair without funding political parties? Supposing we want to fund political parties for our cause, can the budget sustain it? One. Two. To what extent are we funding? Three. Um, if we have our 100 political parties, what do we do? You know, well, I'm not in favor, but if that will solve the problem of the monetization of our politics, I think I'll go, go for it. But as a priority, I don't think I go for it. 
All right, so uh, doc, doc, Dr. Vladimir, please hold on for us. Um, we also have Dr. Aledu Seydu still on the line with us. Dr. Seydu. Hello. Yes, so um, how do you think if the state is funding political parties, um, give, give a suggestion, how should we go about that? I think we can look at best, best practices in the United States of America, in Great Britain, and in other countries that these things are being done. If we open up the floodgate without a condition to fund political parties, it suggests that every individual will wake up one day and want to establish a political party. It becomes business because there is a state funding for it. But we have to devise a, a mechanism. This could be done through a consultative processes where civil society organizations, political parties, and people who matter in this particular, the electoral commission and people who matter in this particular issue can deliberate and come up with a formula. For example, in Britain, the funding is done in, in proportion to the number of seats that you have in parliament, the number of seats that you have won in parliament. So we can look at the best practices across the world. Then we can map out a procedure that will be very, very relevant to the context that we found ourselves. If we open it with blanketly, without a condition, it's going to become very disastrous. But talking about resources, once we are committed to doing it, we can allocate resources for it. There have been a lot of wastage in the system. If we are able to sorry, close these particular loopholes that we've had in the system, we can get enough money to, to give to political parties that are very relevant and that are very competitive to be able to, run, to compete for elections. If we don't do that, we are going to create a situation where every political party that is serious and want to contest for political power, we, we want to use any means, whether it is legal or not legal, as long as they are not fished out, to fund political power. That is what we have had in the past. Strong and the powerful individuals within this country who fund political parties, they win political power, and they determine what the government should do and should not do, because they have found the government to come to power. And even some of these people become untouchable in society because they are a serious financier of a specific political party. When they fall foul of the law, we can hold them to account. So I believe that as a serious nation, we triumph to consolidate democracy. We have to give serious consideration to funding political parties, even if it means conditional funding of political parties, so that some of these illicit way of getting money to finance political parties, whether it's proven or not, can be nipped in the bud. We will have to think about this seriously. The same question to you, Dr. Vladimir Kidanso. Right. Yes. I think somehow, as I've said, I'm not a best for it one way or the other. Uh, but if you ask me, I will not fund some political party to come and rule over me. I mean, the state funds should not be used. Uh, I strongly suspect that within our current political dispensation, if we are very serious, we should be able to uh, nip uh, the drug menace in the bud. Because we'll still, we, we, we may still be funding political parties and the cocaine menace will still be around. That's my concern. And so it is proven to me that funding political parties uh, will necessarily uh, take away the cocaine trade away from West Africa or from Ghana. I'll go for it. You know, so, so I think uh, it's not a done deal when you say that, yeah, let's fund political parties and then we are done with it. I mean, cocaine will not be... Uh, uh, I think it will be a thing of the past. No, let's tackle it head on. Let's, let's, let's uh, um, inject more vigor into our state institutions built for tackling these issues. Let them be autonomous. Let them be filled with people who have a penchant for doing a neat work. And when we are able to get these uh, drug menace out of the country, we should be able to be thinking about whether what we do with political parties and that kind of thing. And, and the political parties will be needed.